Welcome back, everybody, to our next episode as we talk about the Battle of Agincourt today. Uh, if you didn't see the first four episodes talking about the history of the Hundred Years' War, there's a link in the description that will take you back to the beginning of my reactions of this series. There's also a link in the description that will take you to the original content of this particular video. I want to talk real quickly uh, because I think we're diving right into Henry V today. So let's talk a little bit about Henry IV. We talked about him in the last episode, how he, as Henry Bolingbroke, usurped the throne from his cousin, Richard II. So what ends up happening is that uh, Henry Bolingbroke's father was John of Gaunt, who was a powerful uncle of Edward II, or uh, Richard II. And John of Gaunt dies in 1399. His title then, of Duke of Lancaster, among other titles, should have passed directly to his son Henry, who was in exile. Uh, had been exiled by Richard II, but Richard uh, canceled that order and did not allow uh, Henry Bolingbroke to inherit his father's titles. And that sets in motion the chain of events that leads to him losing his crown. So Henry Bolingbroke gets together with the also deposed former Archbishop um, of Canterbury, I think it was, and they decide together that they're going to come back to England. Henry announces that he's coming merely to reclaim his title of Duke of Lancaster, but that's not his plan. When he lands in England, he usurps the crown and he, and he becomes King Henry IV. Richard II is put in prison, dies under mysterious circumstances. We're not really entirely sure how he died, but it was definitely intentional, whatever was done to him, because uh, you can't have a claimant to the throne, a former king, alive somewhere as a source for rebellion. So uh, he's quickly off. Henry Bolingbroke takes the throne. He passes up his cousin, uh, the Earl of March, uh, who was actually the heir apparent or heir presumptive to the throne, meaning that he was heir so long as Richard II didn't have any children of his own. If he had children, then that would become the heir. But in lieu of any children, it should have been the Earl of March. But he was bypassed in favor of Henry Bolingbroke, who was next in line after that. Uh, so uh, Henry Bolingbroke's on the throne till I think, 1413. He dies in his mid-40s. Uh, spends most of his time on the throne just trying to hang on to the throne that he took by force. And then the title passes to his son, who becomes Henry V. That's who we're going to talk about today. Ah, oh, but that's excellent. But wait, didn't he say that you'd been wanting to go to England? Me too. As Me you too. wish. Cat, I can understand for some reason. Okay, Zoe, I got those treats you like from across town. Though I don't know why I needed to go right now to get them. But, oh, you two started the show already. Cool. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'm not um, not upset. I'm just going to continue the story and let you both figure out whatever this is. Henry V is a serious contender for the most impressive man ever to rule England. In the words of a famous historian, Henry had, by the end of his reign, transformed the spirit of his own people and become the arbiter of Christian Europe, dwarfing emperor and pope. Contemporaries agreed. On his death, a chronicler wrote, he did not leave his like upon earth among Christian kings or princes. And he set such a high standard for English kings that many of the kings who came after were constantly trying to live up to uh, the reputation of Henry V. I know Henry VIII, this was a big, big deal for him. Uh, he was somebody who was constantly trying to live up to the standard uh, and wanting to be the warrior and the statesman that Henry V was. Uh, and Henry VIII is actually descended from Henry V's widow, uh, who, and we'll talk about that at some point, I'm sure. But Henry V's wi widow, Catherine of Valois, uh, is actually uh, the person who creates the Tudor uh, claim to the throne through a relationship that she has with a tutor after Henry dies. Henry V was fiercely intelligent, focused, a brilliant military commander and strategist, frighteningly dynamic and energetic. His only fault was to die young. Well, that yep. and being so horrifically ruthless and cold that another historian wrote of Henry that he was conclusive proof that a man may be a hero and yet a monster. Henry became king in 1413. He was fiercely pious and heard mass several times a day. He was also a ruthless advocate of religious unity. His father, the usurper Henry IV, had passed a law called De Heretico Comberendo, which means literally, heretics shall be burned. Henry V was equally determined to rub out any heresy. So, you know, people constantly talk about 
Bloody Mary, uh, Queen Mary, who was the daughter of um, Henry VIII, uh, as being someone who kind of cracks down on heretics, in her case, heresy against the Catholic Church. But there were many uh, kings, including Henry VIII himself, who regularly had people that they viewed as heretics. And these are mostly Christians. These aren't Jews or Muslims or uh, people of other faiths. These are Christians who don't toe the line of the uh, Catholic Church, who start to follow other sects of Christianity, who find themselves uh, being executed for that. And in 1417, he would execute even his companion in arms, John Oldcastle, as a result. For medieval monarchs, the unity of the church was a divinely ordained responsibility, but it was also good politics. The church was far and away the most effective propaganda and communication device any medieval ruler could hope for. In the first two years of his reign, Henry made quite clear who was boss. He had a talent of creating a sense of collaboration, consultation and purpose amongst his great men, while being utterly ruthless with anyone who stepped out of line. Thus, as his army waited to sail for France in 1415, his very last act, was to execute a man of royal blood, a grandson of the great Edward III for trumped-up reasons. Of and I don't know why they keep doing this, but every time they say Edward III, they show Henry III, which was the father of Edward I. Um, but no, it was Edward III, uh, who they're talking about here, the grandson of treason. Henry V always intended to make war on France. As far as he was concerned, he had been cheated of his birthright, as established by the Treaty of Bretigny in 1360. And if the French wouldn't give it to him, he would take it from them. So there. The French, meanwhile, had recovered their effortless arrogance, and in so many words, they informed Henry that his mother was a hamster and his father smelled Smelt of elderberries. elderberries. All right, once again, just got to appreciate the Monty Python reference. That's all I'm saying. Henry would show them they'd chosen the wrong guy to call the son of a hamster. In 1415, Henry appealed to English patriotism by repeating Edward III's charge that the French were trying to eradicate the English language. From now on, Henry made sure English was the official language of England. He even wrote open letters to his people in English. Of course, he backed that up by contracting 320 captains and from the towns and villages all over England, archers and knights set out for Southampton to join their king. And in August 1415, an army of 12,000 left England. Henry tried one last letter to the Dauphin of France. It read, And if you're not familiar, Dauphin is usually the heir to the throne. It's the equivalent to modern England's Prince of Wales. Friend, give us what we are owed, and by the will of the Almighty avoid a deluge of human blood. Mm. Not sure he was serious about the friend thing. In France, the mad King Charles VI was about as useful as a chocolate teapot. But despite the squabbling of the royal dukes, the Dauphin managed to pull together a united front. And when Henry landed at the walls of Harfleur, he was in a dangerous position, exposed and vulnerable. At Rouen, just 50 miles away, the French army gathered. Capturing a base quickly was essential, but Harfleur fought heroically, and it was six long weeks before it finally agreed to yield. Harfleur's stubborn resistance gave Henry a further problem. It was now almost October. Medieval armies went home for winter. Supplying an army of any size through winter was practically impossible. But to go home after capturing one poxy castle was not in the playbook for either hero or monster, obviously. Marching all the way through French territory to Calais just to show the French that he could would be utterly daft. So that is, of course, what Henry decided to do. Just to make the message absolutely clear, he'd follow the route of Edward III and cross the river Somme at Blanche Tac. As they marched north, the English army left a brown trail of poo behind them. Dysentery, the biggest killer mm. of medieval warfare. Camp thief. And I got to appreciate the Oregon Trail reference there. If you're like me, you may have grown up playing that game, uh, Oregon Trail, and there's that famous thing where it says, you have died of dysentery. So I think that's really awesome that they showed that there. As it was called, and Henry's army had it in spades from the camps around mm. Harfleur. They were weak, riven by illness, and really in no condition to fight. And so Henry played it safe, and he took a route to stay away from the Dauphin's army, gathering at Rouen. Sadly, the French were not blithering idiots and had learned from last time. Sadly, the French were not blithering idiots. I love that. They'd closed the ford at Blanche Tac. Once again, though, the English managed to find a way to cross the River Somme, but this time the French were already ahead of them. Mm. Near the village of Agincourt, as the English crested arise, they were faced by the terrifying sight of the French just waiting for them. Think about this if you're Henry V. You're newly on the uh, throne of England. Uh, you are leading an army that's in enemy territory, ravaged by dysentery, which is a, a disease that plagued armies for centuries, all the way up through the Civil War in America and beyond. Uh, 
And now you run into this powerful French army that's between you and your home base in Calais. Uh, most estimates have the English outnumbered anywhere from three or four to one in this battle. Everything looks really, really bad. But then Agincourt happens anyway. The disease-ridden English army was probably down to about 8,000 now, 6,500 of whom were lightly armed archers. Facing them was something like 15,000 heavily armed Frenchmen. Again, uh, 15,000 heavily armed Frenchmen, but if you count all of their retainers and all of the uh, armed kind of servants that they had with them who could be pressed into battle, it was closer to 25,000, I think. The French had learned the lesson of Cressy, and this time they waited overnight. The sound of their partying drifted over to the camp of the cold, wet and sick English. The following day, the French did not just charge, they waited. And so both armies waited as the rain poured down, soaking earth, clothes, bodies, staring at each other across a ploughed field. And that rain is an important part of this. And I will say this. Uh, there's a movie that came out on Netflix a couple of years ago called The King. Uh, it's very loosely based on the history of Henry V. Uh, there's a lot of things that are incredibly wrong in it, especially where it concerns uh, Hotspur Percy's rebellion in 1403, um, things like that. But one thing it gets pretty close to accurate is its portrayal of the Battle of Agincourt and how that actually went down, even what the battlefield looked like with the uh, the woods on either side and then this muddy plain in the middle. Uh, we'll see what they have to say about it here. The French had a plan, and it did not include charging at the English to be mown down by arrows. The English had a plan. It involved the French charging at them and being mown down by arrows. Stalemate. Henry had to provoke a response. Mounted on a white horse, he gave the signal. English trumpets blared. Now strike, came the order. With the flash of a white baton, the whole army advanced to longbow range and unleashed a storm. Satisfyingly, the French panicked, forgot their plan and attacked. The story is well known. The French attacked the English line over the mud of a ploughed field. As they came on, they were hammered by archers. When they arrived, they could barely stand in the mud, let alone fight, and they were hacked down. Henry would let nothing stand in the way of victory. Without Ruth, he sent a body of 200 English archers to slaughter all the helpless French prisoners in the English camp. To sh so, so what happens without Ruth? That's an interesting way to say ruthless. Um, so what he does is he's got his main force in the center uh, with all of his uh, armored troops. He ends up putting all the archers in these two sets of woods uh, on either side. If you can imagine the woods going this direction, up and down, with Henry's force right here and then the French force right here. And so as the French march through the mud straight at the armored forces of the English, they've got the longbowmen firing into them from either side on their flanks, just devastating them. Plus, they get stuck in the mud. And yes, Henry does have most of the, at least the low-born prisoners, uh, killed because he doesn't want them to be able to have a, a further opportunity down the road in a year or two to fight against him again. But he does spare most of the nobility that survives, but a lot of the nobility did not survive. Uh, French nobility was just pretty much wiped out in this battle. Show the French that Henry would stop at nothing to achieve victory. The French got the message and they fled. The great men of France lay dead in the mud and blood or were captured. That night, as Henry celebrated at supper, the Dukes of Orléans and Bourbon were made to serve him. It was the ultimate humiliation. Great victory though it was, Agincourt was the opening of a war, not the end of it. In 1417, Henry was back with a new army, this time going city to city to make himself King of France. And city by city, northern France began to fall to his talent. At last, in 1418, after a six-month siege, he captured the mighty Rouen, capital of Normandy, 70,000 people strong, half as big again as London. Against him, the French were now led by John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy. By now, the Duke was almost richer and more powerful than the French monarchy itself. His court had become Europe's cultural centre, famed throughout Christendom. This made it difficult for the Dauphin to like or trust the Duke. No heir to the French throne likes to have a subject more powerful than he was, who might just take a shine to his throne. No duke likes to feel that his monarch is jealous enough to cut his throat. This made conversations a little awkward, but they eventually <laughs> agreed to meet on neutral ground, on a bridge between their two camps. The security arrangements were elaborate, and as it happens, rubbish. Because on the 10th of September 1418 on the bridge, Duke John the Fearless was hacked to death by the Dauphin's men. This was an act of breathtaking brutality and buttock-clenching stupidity. 
So yep. it clenchingly stupid, in fact, that when a hundred years later the French King Francis I visited the friary where the skull of John the Fearless was held, he remarked, Here is the hole through which the English entered France. John the Fearless' his son was understandably miffed that his dad had been hacked to death, and there was only one man capable of wreaking the vengeance he thirsted for, Henry. There you go. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Uh, he basically taking advantage of a huge rift uh, between the two most powerful people in France, and that is what does it in the end. So England and Burgundy agreed to replace the Valois dynasty with the Plantagenet dynasty as kings of France in the form of Henry V. The Anglo-Burgundian alliance was irresistible. England's steamroller controlled vast swathes of northern France, Normandy, Maine, Touraine, Anjou, and even Paris itself. The Dauphin was a washed-up has-been loser on the run. By and remember, you know, going back to showing the areas that they controlled, remember the Plantagenet dynasty starts with the marriage of the Duke of Anjou to Matilda, who was... Uh, former Holy Roman Empress, but then um, heir to the throne in England. And it's through them that their, her son, Henry II, becomes the first Plantagenet King of England. He's the descendant of Anjou and England. And even Paris itself. The Dauphin was a washed-up has-been loser on the run. By 1420, the mentally ill Charles VI was forced to agree to an astounding Treaty of Troyes. By this treaty, Henry would be married to the king's daughter Catherine of Valois. Their children would be the heirs to the throne of France. In 1420, Henry and Catherine tied the knot. In December 1421, Catherine gave birth to their son, who would therefore be King of France. But while Henry had no military equal, camp fever was a challenge too far for him. And as he campaigned, dysentery caught up with him, and on August the 31st, 1422, he died. But he died only after having conferred with his brother, John, Duke of Bedford, about what should happen next, which was a good thing because the new king of England was nine months old and a good deal more interested in filling his nappies than ruling his new kingdoms. And that, you know, we talked uh, previously about how the, uh, the death of the Black Prince is one of the big dominoes that gets England rolling toward the Wars of the Roses. Uh, this is the other big one, is the death of Henry V at the age of 35, at the height of his power, right when he has taken uh, the throne of France, and uh, in his son uh, will merge the crowns of England and France. Think of how different world history could have been if Henry V had not died, if he had lived to be an old man and given his son Henry VI time to grow up before he had to take the throne instead of becoming uh, the heir to two powerful kingdoms at nine months old. Uh, this is the moment at which England starts hurtling towards uh, a generation or more of civil war uh, in the form of the Wars of the Roses. So uh, big, big deal. I don't know if they have more to this series, but I would definitely love to continue this conversation. So here's what we're going to do. If there isn't any more, uh, to uh, this extra credit series on the um, the wars, uh, the Hundred Years' War. I'm going to continue tomorrow with something else that'll pick up the story here because I want to continue talking about what happens next through Henry the Sixth. But let me know your comments uh, in in the comment section below. Please hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already, and we will see you again tomorrow as we continue the story. Thanks for watching.